All right. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm, my name is Chuck Carter, and uh, I did half of the artwork in Mist, and did a lot of the concept work for the game uh, when we needed it. And uh, then I moved on to other games. And basically, uh, at this uh, presentation, what I'm going to do is kind of show a little bit of the work that I've done. Uh, not with Mist, you guys are all intimately familiar with all of that. So uh, probably a lot more than I am actually nowadays. Uh, but um, what I want to do is kind of show just a brief overview of what I've done since I left Cyan, and then show a game that we're working on right now called Zed, uh, which is for um, uh, it's being made in Unreal, and uh, we're talking to a publisher, but we don't know what's going on with that yet. That's uh, kind of the same with all these types of things. But also, we're going to be publishing it on, on Steam and, and GOG and the App Store. And uh, we've got already uh, three different um, uh, three Oculus headsets, Rifts already, that Oculus sent us, and a couple of Vives of that, that HTC sent us. And we've been playing with those. And so we want to make sure that whatever we make is going to be viable along all platforms. And down the line, we'll look at PlayStation uh, 1, or 3, rather, excuse me, and 4, as well as Xbox One. So I get them all mixed up after a while. But I uh, also want to have a chance, if anybody has any questions about what it was like to work at Cyan during the Mist days, from somebody who was not a Miller, uh, so <laughs> or an Atris, or a Cirrus, or, you know, Akinar. I forget their names. God, this is terrible. So, but uh, we all know that Atris can't cook, and uh, so, but he gets all of his underlings to cook for him and design all of his, his gear for him. You know, that's one of the... the uh, advantages you have of actually, you know, being able to create worlds. So anyway, what I do when I'm not um, working on Zed right now, I do a lot of work to support the company for NASA uh, and National Geographic and Scientific American. I do uh, a little bit of uh, illustration, some animation, and some of the NASA stuff that I get to do, I get to work with some pretty fun projects um, like stuff about tiles on Mars, which is still very experimental and and this kind of thing, it's, it tends to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's stuff I get to work with some fairly famous scientists. Uh, Carl Sagan's former partner. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of Carl Sagan. Okay, so Lewis Friedman is, was his partner, and they started the Planetary Society. And I had an opportunity to work on this, uh, this illustration kind of describing what uh, interstellar space looks like. And uh, I had to learn a lot about something called logarithmic scale. Does anybody know what logarithmic scale is? A couple of people out there. Well, I, let me tell you, for an artist uh, learning about math concepts like log logarithmic scale is, uh, was quite the challenge. Um, I've also had a chance to do, gosh, let me see. Here's kind of an overview of some of the, uh, some of the pieces that I've had a chance to do for NASA. This is something that sort of, sort of shows an illustration. I know this isn't game-related or misrelated, but the one point I'm trying to make is that when I left Cyan, I did all kinds of stuff. I went in and I did all the science stuff and I worked on a ton of other games. Uh, this is just something kind of showing us a red dwarf exploding outward in a, in a, in a big fiery um, uh, plasma burst and how an exoplanet they discovered has been getting bombarded regularly by, by uh, these, these solar flares that are a million times bigger than what Earth or what our sun puts out. And they found water on this planet. And so this is something that's really interesting is if life could survive it. So it's kind of fun stuff to get to play around with. Other game work I've done that relates to the game stuff is, um, let me see if I can find the game art. Uh, has anybody ever played the Red Alert games? Or how many game players, how many people you guys play games outside of the Myst series? <laughs> hey, that is really great. Any, any Red Alert or, or uh, um, Command and Conquer fans out there? A few of you. Okay, I... I've done a ton of work for those games. I was a computer graphics supervisor in them. I worked on a game called Dune uh, Emperor Battle for Dune, uh, which I was an uh, art director, and I got a chance to do a ton of work for that. I was one of the first artists to the, actually kind of figure out what Seleucus Secundus is, if anybody's familiar with the Dune universe. That, to me, is awesome stuff. Um, I got to work on projects um, that uh, we only had like a week to do a demo, a full working demo on. And this is one of them right here, some of the things that we had a chance to work on. I had to build about 40 objects in less than a week and then stick them into a level. So it's kind of like working on Zed right now. So these are just some background stuff I did for various other games, uh, the Command and Conquer stuff. I do a lot of drawing, so I, I get a chance to do some kind of creature design and uh, something I, I find that I really enjoy. I, I draw in Photoshop and Painter using a Wacom tablet. Um, I get a chance to kind of figure out some things. It's kind of fun. Some other game stuff I've worked on. 
Uh, worked on Dune Emperor. I had to redesign the worm a little bit, which was kind of cool. I got to kill a giant worm, which is fun. Uh, this is some Seleucus Secundus stuff. This, there's a big animation that's involved with this. And some other things, another creature. This was from somebody's favorite game, uh, Above and Beyond, Earth Above and Beyond. Was that Earth and Beyond? Yeah, so I got this is one of Douglas Chang's, uh, Doug, Doug, Doug Chang's designs. Doug Chang designed all the starships for, a lot of the ships for the, uh, the Star Wars number one. You know, the ships were nice. You know, I also know the artist who designed Jar Jar Binks is a good friend of mine. And she says, she says please don't blame her. She says it was George Lucas. Terrell Whitlatch is her name. She's awesome. So this is just some of the art stuff. Uh, Knox, this is a piece I did for Knox. I know you didn't like the, the cinematics, but this is from one of the cinematics. Uh, this is another Doug Chang spaceship I got to design. Another creature. And then, of course, Mist. Yeah, Mist. So there's a little story about Mist, uh, about the actual... I don't know if, if anybody, if any of the Millers ever told you they were planning on drawing it by hand. Originally, did they tell you about that? Well, I happened to live in Spokane at the same time, and I'd already been experimenting with all these 3D terrains. And I happened to show these guys uh, a lot of the work that I was doing. That's how I got the job there, basically, because I lived just basically a few miles away from each of them. And they lived, uh, one Rand lived way out in the middle of nowhere in a trailer, you know, basically. And I'm serious, it was a trailer. Was, I don't think it may not have been even a double wide, if I'm not sure. But, um, you know, he doesn't live in a trailer anymore. But, uh, but anyway, and Robin lived in town, and I was doing a bunch of different terrain tests uh, using 3D models, trying to dev develop a terrain that looked real and we could do things with it. But the technology was very primitive back then, but it was encouraging, and then we just started talking. Robin was working in some 3D stuff back then as long as, as I was too, and we were pretty much pioneers. We're a group of, there was a, probably a group of a couple hundred around the country actually doing 3D back in the early 90s, and I was one of them. Robin was another one of them. And we were just getting our hands on this early technology. So I'd also done this thing called the, the Magic Shop and the ABC House I was working on, which were based off of Robin's first game. Uh, it was called the Manhole. Anybody hear the Manhole? Yeah. All right, cool. Anybody hear the Manhole, the Masterpiece Edition? That was mine. <laughs> I did all that in a month and a half, two months. So that was done with Stratavision. Anyway. Uh, Robin did this this in the manhole, and I, I saw it, and that's what inspired me to want to do a mist-like game was because I saw what they were able to do, you know, using HyperCard, of all things, and uh, still images by being able to click and design a world that you turn right, left, just like mist. Uh, essentially, it's a very glorified slideshow with some motion faked into it to make it look kind of like you were moving through the world. But when we started doing mist, it was talked originally to do it all in Photoshop, and... We looked at the 3D thing, and we figured out, hey, putting 3D cameras around would make things a lot easier if we were to actually build out all the models for the game. And uh, so that's sort of how that whole, that whole progression began. And it was something that was, you know, as all of us kind of contributed into the idea of how we would actually do it. And the stuff with my, my ABC house, essentially, I was using the concept of, of what the manhole was, but I was building out each of the rooms for the house. Each, each room had a different letter to the alphabet. And uh, I was building them all out in 3D and moving a camera around in it. And that kind of was part of the genesis for how Mist eventually became a 3D uh, actual uh, game, uh, you know, in as far as we were rendering off the different views. So that was that. And then these are, these are some recent things I just did for a little game company. Um, they gave me a day and a half for each one of these images here. I worked very, very, very fast. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so it's a Venn and a little company in, in Connecticut. Uh, they do a number of games like Leg Legends of something, Valor, or something like that. They pay me. I don't care what they call it. So, <laughs> Which is what Cyan did with Mist for me, too. So, That's why if I seem ignorant to all the different uh, you know, legends and, and all the terminology that comes from Mist, please forgive my ignorance. It was a job. You know, I paid the bills. My youngest son was born just before Mist came out. And you'll get a chance to meet him. He'll be here tomorrow. So, and he's now 22 years old, 23 years old. So these are just some more images. And uh, I use a little bit of everything when I do 3D. I use Moto as my main 3D program. Uh, this was done in Moto. And uh, I just built it all out. I sculpt stuff in something called ZBrush. Anybody ever hear of ZBrush? Awesome. A couple of people. If you don't know ZBrush, find out. There's a free program called Sculptress. Yep, Sculptress is great. It's like ZBrush Junior. 
if you really want to try 3D sculpting, it's a lot of fun. And uh, so this is the art that some of the stuff that I've done through the years. You know, I'm not going to go bother and show you all the stuff I did for National Geographic and and uh, you know all these other clients because it's just would probably be very boring. I've done a lot of stuff. Oh wait, there is one thing I do want to show you. There's one person in particular who'll find this interesting. Got to find it. Where, ah, there it is. Babylon 5, yes. This is one of my matte paintings from Babylon 5 I had a chance to do. Uh, I was, something which, the thing too, when you're working in television, you have, they give you a sketch, and they say, okay, I need this uh, by Friday, you know, and it's probably Tuesday. So this is something I knocked out in about four days. And uh, not sleeping, I lived in a place called St. George, Utah, which is not far from here. This goes straight uh, down uh, Route 15, and uh, bam, there's St. George before you get into Nevada and Arizona Strip over there. But uh, the trees in this, actually, I had an early digital camera that was a whopping, I think it was um, 800 pixels. I forgot what it was. 800 pixels, I think, was the, the megapixel. There was, there was no such thing as megapixel. It, was, it took an 800 megapixel wide image. And I remember standing up on the cliffs taking pictures of trees. And this was an early version of Photoshop before there were layers. So if you have any idea of what Photoshop was like without layers, I can tell you intimately it was slow. And uh, you made a mistake, you pasted something over the top of it constantly. So that was one of the things. I used an early version of a program called LightWave here and uh, Form Z, an electric image, to make this image and then brought it all into Photoshop. I've got a whole bunch of other uh, stuff that I don't have copies of it right here uh, that I did for Babylon 5. Let me see if I got into my matte painting section. Now these are some of the digital matte paintings that I've done through the years. Uh, that's from Dune Emperor. Um, Dune Emperor, Dune Emperor, Dune Emperor. There's, there's another one from, from uh, ba Babylon 5 right here. Kind of a close-up of one area. In the, in the animation of this, there were little carts moving around carrying boxes. And if you looked real closely, you could see a couple guys chasing each other uh, down over in this area here. And that's when the camera kind of zoomed into it. And this is for TV shows that never made the light of day. I did a ton of uh, artwork for a lot of proposed television shows. Another Babylon 5, if anybody's familiar with the Teep Farm. This is the Teep Farm image that I did for them. And the camera pans across it. And, and these little little clone Teeps are all sitting around. You know, their little hands are moving. Little bubbles are coming up out of their face and other things. And got to love After Effects, you know. After Effects, a big still image. You can make things look like they're 3D and real and everything else. It's, it's a lot of fun. So... This is um, stuff that I've worked on. Now, what I'm doing now is I'm working on this game called Zed. How many of you have heard of Zed? Great. How many of you supported us on Kickstarter? Great. You guys get an actual postcard, the ones who support us on Kickstarter. If there's any left over, you guys who didn't help us out, you know, maybe. You can, you can, get, a, you can get a Zed sticker. So I've got to play a Zed sticker. But I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, Zed, is, Zed is the game we're working on now, and it's funny, everybody who looks at it keeps telling me that it looks like Mist. And I'm thinking, you know, I didn't really want it to look like Mist, but, you know, I guess after so many years, you kind of develop a style that people recognize, and, and so Zed kind of ends up looking like Mist in some degree. What's this? No, I don't want that. Oh, what's it asking me to do now? The world of Zed. Go this way. Am I misreading something here? Glasses. Hmm? Ah, this is why I need glasses. <laughs> this just sucks getting old. I'm going to be 60 next year. It's like, ah, 60. So anyway, these are some images from Zed. Um, I'm trying to pull in some of the stuff that I do and that I live in uh, with this game. Zed is based around, um, based around some dreams that I've had. Uh, a lot of the symbology in this game is based around my own dreamscapes. I dream very... Uh, I guess you could call it schizophrenic dreams that are all over the place. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is bring in some of these dream, this dream symbology into a story about a dying dreamer who's dying. He has dementia, and his last project he wants to do is finish a, a children's book for his unborn granddaughter. He's estranged from his daughter, but he knows he's dying, but he can't even remember how to tie his shoes sometimes. So he's kind of interspaces his, this ability to, to not remember anything or lack of ability uh, to have these moments where he can remember things. And when you play in the game, your goal basically is to help him put together through his mind this children's book so he can actually produce it and leave this, this kind of story for his granddaughter. But in the meantime, uh, you've got two aspects of his mind that are playing against him. One is a part that doesn't want to face all the other memories and, and actually enjoys, or not enjoys, but 
I guess maybe appreciates the fact that he can't remember the past because it's very hurtful for him and he doesn't like to face it, whereas the other side is a, a part of his personality that wants to really finish this and, and accepts his responsibilities for things he's done in the past. So this is the story that we're trying to tell, and you're in basically in his dreams as you try to help him find the elements to be able to put this story together and dealing with both aspects of one that wants to help and the other that puts up obstacles. We've got a guy named Joe Fielder who's helping us uh, do the writing right now. Joe Fielder did Bioshock Infinite and a number of other games. He's pretty well known amongst uh, particular video game circles as a really excellent writer, and, has, and he's added a lot to the story already. And uh, the voice of the dreamer, uh, anybody ever play Fallout 4? A few guys? Okay. You know, who, you know Valentine, the character? Oh, my God. So we've got Stephen, Ru Stephen Russell's the voice of the dreamer. And there's about four or five other characters in the game, too, that you won't ever see, but you'll hear their voice or see images of them in some way uh, that we're looking at a bunch of other actors uh, who are well-known in the video game circles that we want to bring on board for us. And, and uh, so that's uh, kind of what we're trying to do. So these are, these are some of the images from Zed. Uh, these are all what I call, this is my version of a white box. Um, I like to do things where I may not necessarily, I build out models that have very simple textures on them, and I start gradually adding them into the world to try to develop what the look and feel of the game is. And uh, this is all connected up, and, and uh, the final version won't look quite like this. It's just a little too much geometry in the rocks. So I'll be pulling that out. It doesn't work well uh, on, on slower machines. But um, these are images from different parts of the game, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're doing. Um, I like to take different, like, uh, I like the game itself, the dreams are going to be very different. Every dream is going to be a very different feel from the last one. You know, while it's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of games do this, you know, it's not like a book where you're changing things, but it is definitely you're going into different aspects of different dreams that this guy has, and you transition to them, you know, in a multitude of ways. And uh, this is something I sculpted in, in Sculptress, actually. It's kind of something I knocked together for a demonstration for a class I was teaching. And I thought it was kind of cool, so I put it in a game as a stand-in. I might keep it in a game. Who knows? But it looks cool, so I thought, hey, let's keep it there. Uh, some of the other stuff, we were at PAX, and we got a chance to show off a lot of the game um, to different people. There we all are standing there, a couple of people working with me. This is our producer. She handles a lot of modeling. Calvin is my programmer. And there's some crazy people, so Seth. But, um, you know, we, we got a, a really decent team that's built up here now. Let's see if we can find some other. This is a different part of one of the levels. Uh, it's a totally different level than the level you've seen as far as the, uh, uh, the one kind of Sean Tan version. Anybody hear of Sean Tan? Okay, cool. He's an excellent illustrator, children's book illustrator. And uh, his work is very inspiring and, and inspired some of the architecture from uh, the Zed demo level that we did. This moon, by the way, will be found in every single level of the game. It, I won't tell you what he does, but it's a very important aspect to the game. It'll be in some different form, but you'll find it throughout the entire game. And then we've got uh, some parts of the cityscape here. Uh, this tower here is, if you live in Bangor, Maine, is known as the, uh, the standpipe. Now, I like to put familiar items in, in when I'm developing. And since I'm doing this whole game pretty much, everything you're seeing here I built myself except for some of the rocks and trees. Uh, and I did them. I did almost all the models for the city in about in about four days. I think it took me to build them all. And uh, the level, the first few iterations of the level took less than two weeks to make and make it playable. Uh, it's amazing what you can do when you don't sleep. And uh, and after done, having done this for twenty some years, you know, I kind of learned a lot of shortcuts. But this standpipe uh, object here is a water tower uh, that uh, I live two blocks from Stephen King. And uh, Stephen King has used this in it. And I think uh, there's a couple of other stories he's written, books he's written, that this has had some big influence or been mentioned in some weird way. So I figured, hey, what the heck? It's recognizable. If you live in Maine, you know what this is. If you live in Boston, you might. Maybe not. But this is some of the views from the game. We'll take a little walk through here in just a second. Uh, this is a different part. Let's see if this opens up. Okay. This is a different part where the walls are constantly moving and you're shifting. There'll be places where you'll have to actually push in blocks in order to be able to, to gain access to different parts of this kind of blocky canyon. And this element here in the middle, there's a, a, there'll be a device down here that you have to send up a, a flare, so to speak, that will ignite and then essentially open up one last piece of this level that lets you get into the dream and the reason why you're here. So I won't tell you too many of the details. 
But this level also changed the look. This is still a very early version of it as well. So let's go back to the world of Zed. And we've got one last thing here. So one thing I like to try to do is to give whatever I'm working on, I'd like things to have a bit of a, a unique look to them. And I use something called Unreal Engine to do all for all the games. Uh, we're using that to put the game together. Um, a lot of these rocks came from available content in Unreal, which is free. If anybody downloads Unreal, it's free to use. Uh, I know there's some Unity users out there, and the only thing I can say to Unity is, sorry, <laughs> actually Unity is a very good program. Don't let me tell you wrong. It's very, very good. It just doesn't have the maturity that Unreal has as far as building a game goes. And we've got, you know, there's the trees, and I try to get some different looks and feels in the game. Because uh, when you're in the game, you change the environment. That's one of the key things in the game itself. You're changing the way the, the dreamer is dreaming as you play the game. And some of these things are changed through devices, through where you visit. Uh, has anybody ever played a game called the Stanley Parable? Okay, cool. Stanley Parable is one of my favorite games lately. That And Dear Esther is also, I don't know if anyone's ever played Dear Esther or not, it's another beautiful, beautiful game. It tells a wonderful, well, sad story, but it is something that, that was a, you know, kind of an inspiration for me to try to do something again by myself or with a small company that I created your games with. And uh, these are some more shots of uh, when you're walking through the world, looking for different looks and feels, trying to give you a little bit of a different feel for how the whole world will look. And uh, so without further ado, what I'll do is close all of these. And this is Unreal, basically what they call the Unreal um, browser. It lets you browse through all of the, uh, you know, your games that you've made through up here, as well as it has this kind of community area where you can get a chance to see what other people are doing. They talk about their, you know, I just decided I was going to use 4.12 release version, and I just now noticed down here they've got this thing now called 4.13. It's like, ugh. You know, because all the assets, everything changes from one level, from one version to another. Why can't they just, like, do 4.12.13? You know, I mean, just leave it there. But uh, uh, that's the one frustrating thing about Epic that I, I find frustrating. Anyway, you've got this community. You've got this area where you can learn stuff. It has all the different blank screens. It's, it's trying to catch up on the Internet. There we go. It has all this stuff, uh, all kinds of start, starter tutorials if you want to get into it. It's a great place to go to learn it. The Marketplace... Um, is a place where, you know, we're a small team, and a lot of times there's a lot of objects that there's no reason to rebuild a chair. There's no reason to rebuild a table or a window sill or any of that stuff. You can get the stuff online in a hundred or a couple hundred different iterations, both for free and for uh, a small fee that they charge for stuff, as well as animations and all that sort of thing. So a small studio, this is really geared toward indie gamers, and definitely Eager Games is an indie game company right now. Uh, we're trying to do something that looks very AAA, but, you know, we, we are still a very small company. And honestly, Cyan, we were probably, at Cyan, we were probably one of the first, we were like a lot of other small companies. EA was even tiny back then. And uh, Cyan was four people initially, myself, Robin Rand, and, and Chris Brandcamp. And uh, then we added Rich and uh, Bonnie, I think. And that would pretty much rounded out the entire team that made Mist. And Ryan was sort of, Ryan, the one another brother. It is Ryan, Ran, Robin, and there's another brother that begins with an R. Like Rob, right. Rod, Robert, Rod. Yeah, I, I don't think I ever met Rod, but anyway, they were, they were pretty unique. There's a lot of other unique things about the Miller brothers, too, which I won't get into here. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, they, it was a very, very small team, and it would be, by today's standard, it would be considered an indie game company. By every stretch of, of the meaning of indie game, Cyan was indie game. And that meant that we had no main office. You know, we didn't have the nice big office that they have right now, you know, that looks like a um, kind of like a, I don't know, what's an observatory, uh, what do they call those things, a planetarium. I don't know if anyone's ever been in. Have anybody here, anyone here ever been in their offices? Okay. Good. Wow, that's impressive. That was when, it's, when you guys were at, what, the, the, the mist. Uh, Mysterium was at the Cyan or in Spokane that one year? Yeah. Four times? Wow, very cool. I know they, they film, a, there's a TV show that's filmed in Spokane now called iZombie. No, is that it? Is it Seattle? I saw Spokane listed under, huh? Oh, right, Z Nation, that's it, Z Nation. That's in Spokane. 
So, so to start a little bit of an industry kind of growing up there. But anyway, um, they have this, this huge office now. But back when we did science, when we worked on MIST, MIST was essentially um, my basement room was one office. Uh, Robin had a bedroom, I think, that he, no, he used a, yeah, a bedroom. Then he bought another house and put it in a basement. And, uh, and Rand had a double wide, it was a double wide, that's right. And he added an additional room to the double wide trailer. And uh, so that was his big expense. And Chris built a garage with a second story that Chris would handle all the business stuff. So that was, Cyan was spread out. You know, I think we we're all pretty, pretty far away from each other for the most part. But Zed right now, we do have offices, actually, at Eager Games. We have two offices um, that uh, there's four of us that are basically occupying them at various times. And um, what we try to do is, uh, you know, get the company together. We do a lot of things remotely. Anybody here work remotely with each other in, like, maybe Starry Expanse or things like that? Everybody's always working. Well, I tell you, with Skype, uh, we use something called Slack. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Slack. Okay. Slack is great. They need a video component, though. That would help it a lot. Um, anyway, so going back to this, the, the marketplace, we've got, you know, you've got a, anything you can pr pr practically imagine asset-wise you can buy or get. And then here's my library of stuff that I use. So it represents a couple thousand dollars worth of investment right there. But I tell you, it's a lot cheaper than hiring artists to do a lot of it or programmers or anything else. And what we do is we take it and we tear it apart, rebuild it, and make it for whatever we need. If I, like when I worked at, Elect when I worked at um, Westwood Studios, we had 250 people that worked there. And some of us were just making chairs, and some of us were just making tables. And, you know, you got kind of pigeonholed. Maybe not so much at Westwood, but Vicarious Visions. Anybody hear of Vicarious Visions? Marvel Ultimate Alliance, uh, Transformers, Guitar Hero. Those are other games I worked on. Um, the thing that's nice about having all this stuff, though, is that if I have to iterate very quickly, and that's one thing that you end up doing when you're building any kind of game, you're always changing something. Now, the game itself, the engine itself, looks like this. This is what, what the game engine looks like when you first get into it, uh, if you have a game built into it, which is what I've got right here. Now this is, let me get my keys control here. Okay, so basically this just allows me to, okay, let's move through here. There we go. So this is what the world looks like before you're actually walking through it. Everything is an object. Everything's a piece. Like this is a piece that I can find a Handle, move it up and down. I can, you know, change where it's at real easily. I can simply, you know, I can duplicate it. So there's two of them. Right, I hope I don't crash it. Got a lot of stuff open here. Don't crash, don't crash, don't crash. I should never do this. There we go. So there's another piece of it right there. So I was like two buildings where there was one before. And you can change everything from, you know, localizing what the color looks like or the atmosphere to change the different types of color texture. So that you can get a different look and feel very easily in it. All the objects, I use a program called Moto to build everything uh, and uh, ZBrush for the most part for anything that's organic. Uh, the only thing you see in here from the, from the uh, asset store are these rocks and the trees. Everything else is something that I built uh, right now. And now I've got this new artist that's helping me out. He's like 20 years old, and uh, he's scary good. I just have to just kind of do a scribble on a napkin, and he comes back with this, this absolutely gorgeous work. And so he's... This summer, he's already knocked out about 30 different pieces for me for the upcoming, a couple of the other levels that are coming up. He builds all my a lot of the hero pieces. So finding good talent is something that in Maine is typically very hard. Uh, in Salt Lake, it's a little different. There's a huge game industry here, which makes things easy. Uh, you can always, people are constantly jumping from company to company. Now, when you play the game, actually, I'm always trying to do things with, as far as uh, for the gameplay experience, where I'm giving you a lot of things to look at, some depth, uh, a sense of vertical. You know, there'll be places that'll be much more claustrophobic. Uh, you know, from a design standpoint, it's something that, you know, I love that feeling of being immersed in a place. I mean, does anybody like being immersed in a game? All right. Are you guys immersed in Mist? Are you immersed in Riven? Are you immersed in, what was the others? <laughs> Revelations. Those are one that's like Cool Island done by Presto Studios. So is that the third one? Exile, right. And that's that's gorgeous too. That really, Presto did a good job on that. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I, I played uh, Riven for about 20 minutes, and that was that was about it. So I, I was actually working on other games. You know, so I, I have a hard time separating myself out. I play games now a lot more than I used to. I'm playing another game over here. Where is it at? I see. 
Oh no, why are you auto saving? You may hear of Doom. Yeah. Doom Four. Oh. It's it's a lot of fun. I love I love being killed and having my arm ripped off and have it slap me in the head a couple of times. <laughs> it's great. Ah, watching it. Ouch. You know. But it's really good. And in, in VR, I haven't tried my VR sets on it yet. It's supposed to be pretty cool. Anyway, let's let's go to hit the play button. So here's this is what it's like playing. We turn it up a little bit. We've got two great musicians working on the music for us. No Robin Miller, unfortunately. I asked Robin if he could do it. I think he felt there was a conflict of interest. The music right now is still just temporary. This is just uh, all the sound effects are temporary. This was done just for the demo for our Kickstarter. And this is probably why people think this looks like mist because there's just all these platforms everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually now that now that I think about it, that's probably why. There's that big old moon. Now, a, a key is that this moon will take you in cases in certain places from level to level. So you'll have a way to get up to it. Now, there's a there's a constant thing a battle amongst people who play games. Do you want to walk fast? Do you want to walk slow? How do you guys like to walk through an immersive game? You like to walk fast. So you like to walk fast? Have you ever walked fast through a game in VR? It's a good way to throw up. Yes. So we'll have a we'll have a way to be able to, to control your speed in this game. But what's nice though is that in the engine, I just simply drop in a speed tree, and that it has a wind component on it. And I drop in a little thing that says wind is blowing from this direction, and that's all I have to do. And bam, all these trees are all blowing like there's wind. And then I add the wind noise to it. Now in this too, we're trying to you know beat people over the head as far as to hey look, there's a sun. Could that be a clue? And then over here, uh oh, there's a star. Maybe there's some kind of method to the madness of figuring out what this is, a moon. You keep walking around here and you, know, you could jump off, you know, if you want to. But you just sort of pop back up again somewhere. So. Get you pretty close to where you started from. And all these things that say preview means I haven't built a lighting in this yet. That's that's about a four or five hour process. I just didn't think I'd have the time to do it today. There it is, that sun again, the star. Now remember these these symbols, it's very important. We got this extremely complex puzzle coming up. We actually kept the puzzles very simple for this reason. That we wanted people to play the game or play the demo and understand, you know, the real simple things that you have to do. Oh, sun, star, moon, and then the color changes. Dun dun dun. Hope that doesn't freeze on me again. Nope. So then we get the world in color. So this is kind of like just a little bit of a hint about what happens when you start working in the game or playing the game. Now I can go left here, or I can go straight ahead to a sun. Now, I know that Rand and Robin never give away anything that's going on in their game. I'd love to know more about abduction. I have no idea what the gameplay is. Anybody know what the gameplay actually is in abduction? I, I saw people spinning around gigantic uh, you know, metal wheels and that part where the big gears are all moving around and stuff like that. But anybody know what the actual gameplay is? No, no. Okay. Well, huh? Well, I know. I saw the pine cone. That's pretty cool. Well, you're not you're not kidnapped in this game. You know, you just sort of wake up and there you are. You have no idea who you are. I'll give you a hint. You're the dreamer. So, uh oh, I just gave away the whole story. No, you're not the dreamer. But there's things that you know get a chance to to build things and play around with stuff. And this sun. Well, in the actual game itself, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of a, an idea. It's not going to kill anything. Hopefully not. Does anybody want any spoilers with this at all? All right, I'm not going to tell you anything because this sun's very important. But it's only one little important thing. So, Anyway, again, you can see that when you get close to an object, the whole world has changed. You know, in Unreal, it's a very simple thing to do. You just simply put a box and call it a post-process volume. And I can edit the color. I can edit the contrast. The, uh, depth of field. Now the game is about basically about an artist, and a lot of the things you'll be finding are these things uh, that are related to his life as a as a children's book illustrator. This is just one small little piece of art. There'll be places actually in the game. This is not giving anything away where you'll have to solve a puzzle involving like 25 or 26 of these things all floating around you, like and they'll be moving around you in a circular fashion. You'll have to figure out which art, which pieces you're going to need to pick out for the story. So that's just a, a hint about some of the gameplay that's coming. 
mountain. So again, you can sort of look around. Now, I had lots and lots of trees in here before, but after a while, at, at a negative frame rate, I figured I probably should take some of them out. And what's nice too is that uh, I, I'm sure Unity does it as well, and I know that Crisis does it. You can control how your eyes adjust to the light, depending if you're in light, if you're in shadow or not. So if you're in shadow, things lighten up. If you're in bright light, things darken down a little bit like your eyes respond. And we start getting to this area over here, which is another section. Come here and go, oh no, there's a bridge missing. Now, in the actual game, those of you guys who have played the Stanley Parable will know that every time you walk to the end of one hall, there's like a short little walk. And then you turn around and go back thinking you missed a door. Then you come back and you see that, that the doorway you just came through was gone. And you go back again and, and there's a doorway there now. So you can kind of see that the world evolves around you. Zed is going to be a lot of things like that. I'm trying not to steal it, but it is something that it's a really nice mechanic. You're going to utilize it for some things. And then you got one of the pages from the children's book. breeze halfway flying over your head. Now you gotta touch these things. In the actual game, that will be a lot different. The children's book will actually, that page will be inside this tower. And this tower, without giving anything away, is gonna be filled with water. And you're gonna have to figure out how to unfill it. And I won't tell you how, but you know, you'll look through it and you'll see bubbles in water inside one of the windows there. So there's the, uh, this is done by a children's book artist friend of mine named Doug Goldsmith, and this is what he does for a living. And uh, he's phenomenal. The regular pieces are going to be a lot more, they'll be a lot more colorful. And, uh, you know, so it's going to be a 10 page children's book you have to put together. And then we kind of come down over here. Again, I like this sort of feeling. One of my, my uh, favorite designers um, is a guy named Mark Cerny. Uh, you guys may know him through, uh, let's see, what games? Marble Madness was one of his first games he came out with. Uh, Ratchet and Clank. Uh, there's this one about Spyro the Dragon. That's a Mark Cerny game. So Mark, Mark, I worked for Mark for a brief time for about a year in Los Angeles. And we used to have discussions about what makes games fun. And he said, think of a game as a playground. Think of it as a place where you can go up and down and through, you know, be it a 2D game or a, a third-person game. You want to put people in an environment that has a lot of variety to it, which makes it much more interesting to play around in. And now that everything's sort of being done as a virtual reality experience, it's even more fun. So we just keep on walking, walking, walking. Now, there'll be, like, in the actual game on the right there, I've got it in the current version of this. I do want to bring it because I want to show it yet. There's a gigantic machine there, and it's broken. And what do you do with broken machines? Yeah. You trash it. Or you make Atris uh, types of uh, cooking equipment or appliances. So there's a gigantic Atris oven in, in Zed. And there's some... some, and some uh, uh, what do they call them? Dunnets? Dunnets and paninis. So I am going to put probably about five or six different misreferences as Easter eggs in this game. So you guys will get a chance to see things. And so if I come over here and just click on this little thing, it goes up and you finish the demo level, and that's sort of what the demo levels. Now our programmer is not very, he's very good at a lot of things. He doesn't know how to look at a calendar. Okay. Oh, he took it out. Good. Because he used to have, you know, available, uh, the was it Kickstarter? Thank you for playing. Kickstarter will be finishing up on June 31st. There's only 30 days in June, I think, right? So he took it out of this version of it. Thank you, Calvin. So, so anyway, this is just a quick kind of a walkthrough of, uh, you know, what this, this all looks like. And you can sort of see that even while you're playing in the demo version of it, you know, just as the, uh, the editor version of it, you can see all the different look and feel is still there. This is one of the nice things about Unreal. Um, and honestly, my, my argument about using Unreal, I know that some I've, I've heard some people discussing it back earlier, uh, is that Unity is great for mobile games and is designed, you know, it's been, excuse me, improving constantly. But Unreal's been around for a long time, and it's just very mature. And it does everything we want it to do. It's very easy to learn how to use if you're an artist or you're a designer. If you're somebody who just wants to dabble and drag a bunch of stuff into a world and run around it, it's a great you know, program just to do that with. So, anyway, that's uh, this is Zed. Um, I have another level, but unfortunately, it's, it's going to take about half an hour to load. I'm, I know we have an extra, extra half hour here, so I'm trying to kill time by talking a lot. Um, 
So anyway, uh, does anybody have any questions so far about anything? I have stories about Cyan. Does anybody know about Cyan and Rush Limbaugh? Yeah. Oh, God. I was forced to work in a Rush Limbaugh environment. Every time I worked with Robin, that's all I would hear. Rush Limbaugh. You got to listen to Rush Limbaugh. If not, you're fired. No. No, I don't think I was ever threatened to quit, but or fire, get fired. But they 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 talked about Rush Limbaugh a lot. So your question: What first got you into video games? Um, I first got involved into it back in the 1980s. I worked in newspapers, and I was a newspaper illustrator and artist. Uh, towards the later part of my newspaper career, I was an art director for like the Rocky Mountain News. Uh, then I moved to Spokane and became the the Rocky Mountain News is gone now. For how long now? It's been gone for years, I think. Unfortunately, along with other every other newspaper in the country, but anyway, um, I had a chance to uh, when when I was at the Rocky Mountain News, somebody stuck me in front of a little Macintosh. It was one of the little gray Macintosh boxes, a Mac 128, I think it was. Anybody remember? Anybody old enough to remember the Mac 128s or 1 512? Okay, you guys know exactly what they were. Great. That's what the manhole was drawn on. Was one of those things. And they sent me in front of it at the newspaper and said, "Here, we need you to use this and make." stuff for the newspaper with it. And I asked, I said, well, how do you use this? And they held up this this box, which is a lot less elegant than this, uh, that had a big button on it. It was a square thing with a button on it. And said, you got to draw everything with this. And they said, there's a program on there called Mac Draw and Mac Paint, two different programs. And uh, they said, okay, draw a map. So I said, okay. So I looked at the mouse. I saw if you moved it, there's a little cursor moves around on the screen. Open up a program. There's boxes, a line tool, and a couple fills you could put in things. So I started making maps, and then I started looking at you know a little bit more. This is before there was an internet, uh, so like in the mid '80s, and uh, I started playing around with it, and then software started getting a little bit better and better. And at the time, I was I took a job then with a Knight Ritter newspaper in Kentucky, uh, called uh, the Lexington Herald Leader in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, and. I started doing portraits using the computer where I was doing portraits of famous people, you know, for politics or newspaper stuff. And I started uh, playing around with, uh, you know, some of these little tiny games that you can get on f something called floppy disks. I don't know if anybody remembers what a floppy disk is. You know, so I haven't seen one for years, you know. They should be sp selling them for coasters nowadays or something. I'm sure people do, actually. But the thing was is there, there's all these little games in there, and there was this uh, little program called HyperCard. And I started playing around with HyperCard, trying to figure out how can I make something move around and, and, and animate in this. And I figured out a way to kind of animate some real simple, you know, animations using it. And I started playing around with some real simple little game ideas. This is like the late 80s. And then I saw the manhole that came out. And Robin Miller had drawn the manhole. And they were in Texas at some, I guess, some kind of a convention or something. I forget what it was, a, a very early game convention uh, where the games back then were mostly text-based. And Mist started out as a text-based game. It was you're on, an, you're, on a, you're on a dock. On your right, there's a sunken ship. On your left, you see uh, some steps going up to some buildings on a grassy little knoll. And directly ahead of you is a gear. Which way do you go? That's how I learned about Mist when I took the job at Cyan. They walked me through the entire game like that. They read it to me. And uh, they were at this convention, and Robin was selling, they were selling these floppy disks of the manhole at the convention. I think they were selling it for like 35 bucks or $39 or something. I forget what it was cost. But uh, it got caught on really well, and it, it sold really well, and kind of launched Cyan as a company. Well, that kind of launched my game career, playing that game, because I had already been using computers, and by that time I was already using very early 3D software. And I started designing things like the Magic Shop, which was a black and white game like that, and I did all these different uh, things, kind of manhole-ish with the Magic Shop. And then I started working on the 3D stuff and started building the ABC house, and, uh, and then that's sort of where my game career got started. And that, those different projects led me into meeting Cyan, uh, which lived in Spokane at the same time I was working at the newspaper in Spokane. And that's how my game career got started. And then I, after doing Mist, we had a couple of disagreements about ownership, and I decided I didn't want to do anything else with them at that point, and I left. And uh, so 
Uh, I was the only non-owner in Scion. There were four of us. There were three owners. I was non-owner. And they were non-negotiable about, you know, my getting a little piece of it. So I just thought it would be better to try to do something else for a while. So and that was the reason it all kind of ended at that point. But it was amicable. You know, everything was fine. You know, it just was a disagreement. But that led to my doing all these other games. And I've, you know, done 26 other games outside of Mist, And that, I think, has probably rounded out my experience doing all the different stuff with it. So that was my career, how it started. No other questions at all? You don't want to know how? Oh, OK. Um, so how does uh, developing for VR and uh, PCs differ? All right, well, PCs obviously are you're looking at a two-dimensional screen. You can develop the same exact uh, content using a PC. Uh, that you're going to be using for VR. But VR is a different animal. When you're maneuvering around in VR, anybody use VR yet? Has anybody tried an Oculus yet or a Vive? Okay. Have you guys played it extensively yet? No? Okay. Well, I've been immersed in a lot of it lately. I took the whole month off of uh, July pretty much after working on the Kickstarter. We needed a break. And uh, so I, had to, I took that chance to really kind of experiment with the VR stuff. When you're doing something that's going to be on a 2D screen, it's a totally different experience than it is in VR. For one thing, you know, you don't get sick when you're watching, you know, unless some people do if you move too fast through a game. But you're not going to get ill if you're looking at a, at a screen and you're moving quickly through it. I mean, most first-person shooters, you're, you're running constantly. You're always moving and ducking and diving and doing things. Uh, in VR, it's a different experience. You, unless you've got a really fast video card and a computer, uh, the frame rate, the resolving, the frame resolution, uh, what they call it, um, I can't think of what they call it. Uh, there's a word for it. But it's, it's when your mind drops below, when the view start, drops below 90 frames a second, you tend to start getting ill. Your mind is picking up the fact that you are not moving through reality, and it disorients your inner ear, and then you start feeling ill or dizzy. So what you have to do is when you're working in VR, there's a lot of changes you have to make from the 2D version of it to the 3D version. And these changes are more along the lines of interface, uh, trying to optimize better for VR. Um, you know, we're using some, uh, we're using a 1080 card right now to kind of develop on, which is very fast NVIDIA card. Um, but we've also got a 970 and a 980 NVIDIA cards as well. We're running on and checking it on and seem, they seem to handle it okay. But uh, the, main, the main difference between the two is that you've got two totally different experiences. VR, you're right there. You can get up in VR, you can get this close to something, you know, if you're in the edit, you know, because for some reason, collision isn't quite the same. The view, view is different, so you can get close to things. When you're actually in a 2D version of the game, the collision will get in the way, and you'll only be about this far away from it, you know. So there's a difference where you can kind of look at things closely and look at things, you know, from a different perspective or a little bit further away when you're actually playing a 2D game of it. Now, the thing that, that also um, a lot of VR games are doing is where you're clicking and moving a cursor around and then jumping to another point. So you've got a design for that as well. Uh, has anyone ever noticed that? You know, there's a couple of games on the Rift where you click and you move ahead to that point. You snap to a point. Like Mist had uh, that, uh, that speedy thing that you could, huh? What was it called? Zip mode, yeah. I remember those guys were fighting over the name of it. Um, because they, they, they decided to do zip mode because people were getting tired of walking, taking so long to get from point A to B. You know, which actually, considering that Mist Island is probably big as, as big as this room, is probably a good idea to make things relatively slow. So besides that, also the fact that you can get close to things, so they have to be higher detailed where you want people to see things. You have to make things so that way they're optimized enough you're not going to get sick running through it. And uh, you want to create an experience. From my point of view as an artist, I, I don't want you to be, unless you want to get that real claustrophobic thing, I want you to see things. I want to be able to look up. You want to look down. You want to look around. You know, I want the experience to be fully 360 degrees uh, all the way around you so that way you get more out of it when you're playing the game. So does that answer your question at all? There's a lot more technical stuff in it, but... Hi, um, could you talk a little bit about like your influences in terms of like being an artist, where your style comes from? Well, uh, I'm probably older than most of the people in this room, so my my artistic styles come from uh, Star Wars when I was a kid. You know, I was in the Navy actually when Star Wars came out. Uh, so, 
it was uh, there was a, a number of artists that were doing a lot of concept work for Star Wars. Ron Cobb, uh, Ralph McQuarrie, a few of these other guys. Yep, so you know who Ralph McQuarrie is. Cool. So a few of these guys who were doing this really wonderful stuff for Star Wars, and I loved the, the science fiction stuff. But I was also a huge comic book fan. And uh, there's a guy named Bernie Wrightson, Barry Smith, Neil Adams, Jack Kirby. Uh, I, when I, you know, these guys also influenced my work back when I was a kid, wanting me to become an artist. I wanted to become an artist because of these guys. Jack Kirby, uh, I met him at a Cleveland, con con uh, when I was in eighth grade, at a comic book convention in Cleveland where I grew up. And I showed him a bunch of my drawings as this little eager kid, you know, and Mr. Kirby, Mr. Kirby, there's some of my drawings, you know, and he looks at him, he's got a cigar in his mouth, you know, and he looks down and he goes, hey, these aren't so bad, kid, you know, uh, keep it up, you'll be a good artist someday. And I go, wow, I'm going to be an artist, and Jack Kirby told me. And uh, so, uh, you know, I won't tell you what El Harlan Ellison told me one time, but uh, <laughs> does anybody know who Harlan Ellison is? <laughs> All right. <laughs> no? You don't know who Harlan Ellison is? Oh, wow. Okay. He told me, uh, can I use profanity in here? You guys mind? <laughs> right, I'll, t I'll tell that one in a minute. But anyway, uh, as far as other artists uh, go, uh, as I got older, I started getting into children's book authors. Chris Van Allsburg, uh, um, he's, a, he's a, one of my, was, is a favorite, not so much anymore. You know, uh, I think Sean Tan's a big one now. Uh, Jonathan Harris is a, a illustrator, a science fiction illustrator. Um, Gosh, I mean, there's just so many, and, and uh, if you go into my Pinterest page, you know, I've got like five dozen boards of, of, of different artists and different things that I look at, and, you know, the, the web is, I used to collect these books called the Spectrum. They used to be, you know, they have like Spectrum 1, Spectrum 2, and there's a collection of illustrators every year, the best in science fiction and fantasy illustration, and I used to have this huge collection of them. And uh, they were great. I really looked forward every year to get one of those because there's always just a, this, this gigantic hodgepodge of really great art. So, you know, um, I'd say, though, initially it's probably the early comic book artists. That's where I got my, my desire to be an artist. You know, I wanted to be a comic book artist. And then I ended up partnering up with a couple people that were very famous in the comic industry for a little while back in the early 80s uh, and early 2000s. I worked with a guy named Val Mayrick, who was a comic book artist, did a lot of... Uh, of Kung Fu and Conan and a bunch of other stuff. But he also did something called Howard the Duck. <laughs> so, and uh, then I partnered up with a guy he did Howard the Duck with, Steve Gerber, who's a writer, and he was uh, one of my partners when I created a small game company after Westwood Studios folded in Las Vegas uh, back in 19, or 2002. Steve is deceased now, unfortunately. But uh, Steve and, and, and uh, Val were very uh, they influential in how comic book artists get paid nowadays. Uh, because they sued Marvel over the rights for Howard the Duck, because Marvel started producing things and never gave them royalties for it. And so it changed the whole copyright issue and how comics are, you know, paid out to people. And um, if anybody's seen a movie, uh, what is it called, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? Okay. If you, did you stay around to the very end where we saw Howard the Duck? And then if you stayed around just a little bit longer, you said special thanks to Steve Gerber and Val Mayrick. So those were two guys who were my partners <laughs> once. So anyway... That, that pretty much explains most of it, but, you know, I also, you know, art history, I had a really good art class. We, uh, we studied art history in high school, went to all the museums around the Midwest, and, and you know, there's nothing like looking at the classics to, to also just kind of put things in perspective. You know, good art has been around for a long time, so. You're welcome. Yeah. Huh? Oh, by Harlan Ellison. Okay, Harlan Ellison. My, my story about Harlan Ellison is that... Superman, by the way, was uh, created in Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know if anybody knew that, right? Anybody know that Superman was created in Cleveland, Ohio by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster? Okay, well, they had the 50-year anniversary of Superman, and um, it was uh, held in Cleveland, and Harlan Ellison was one of the special speakers for it. And I'd been reading Harlan Ellison because he's a fellow short guy. He's actually the same height that I am. And, uh, you know, but he's a real big asshole. Uh, but Harlan... I got to work with him on Babylon 5 two different times. I met him on set, too, by the way, So, because he, he was one of the creative guys behind Babylon 5, a kind of a consultant. But anyhow, I was at this convention, and Harlan Ellison was standing before the convention, before the, uh, his speech was starting, and he was standing there talking. I'm going up to the bathroom from sitting in the audience and waiting, and I go walk past him, and, and Ellison's the same height, and I looked at him eye to eye, and he looks at me right in the eye, and he's talking to these guys, and and he's looking up at him, and they're like six foot something. And he says, yeah, motherfuckers, I'm like six foot four, and blah, blah, blah. And they're looking down at him laughing, and I walk by him. I go into the bathroom. 
I come back out, and he's standing there looking out. And nobody's around him. He's kind of like, you know, kind of rocking back and forth on his feet with his hands behind his back. And I walk up to him, and I said, six foot four, my ass. And he says, fuck you, asshole. And so, so, <laughs> but it was said with a smile and a sense of humor. So I thought that was, like, really, a, you know, it was great. Have one of my heroes actually tell me that, you know, so... Because I'm still a huge Harlan Ellison fan from his writing, but I've met him and now I, I have absolutely no desire to ever talk to him again. You know, <laughs> so because I know all the people who are working with him right now and trying to get uh, Boy and His Dog remade, and uh, he's been a real dick about it. So anyway, hi. I'm just wondering if you could tell us about are there any different challenges involved in working on a game like Zed in 2016 when there's been such a variety of first-person nonviolent adventures? Versus working on Mist back in 93 when it was pretty much unique. Yeah, well, back in, in, in uh, 93, 92, there, there, were, there were a couple of games that had come out back then. Um, <laughs> you know, it's really funny how, how certain industries tend to uh, lead the way, so to speak, for th stuff like this. One of them was a little game called Virtual Valerie. And it was, anybody heard of Virtual Valerie? Oh, wow, we got one person who's going to admit it. <coughs> so. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Virtual Valerie came out, and it was essentially a full-color version of, uh, of a story about a girl, a woman, and her adventures, so to speak. Uh, and you got a chance to play in it, but it was, it was something that, the way, he had, the way he did it, Mike Signs, I got to know Mike pretty well, actually. He did something called Spaceship Warlock. Anybody hear of that? A couple? One person? Look up Spaceship Warlock. It predated Miss by about two years. And is a fun, fun game. I don't know if you can play it anymore, but it was a great game. And it was very campy. And a guy named Joe Sparks did the music for it. And, you know, like, Spaceship Warlock, you know. And there was the music at the beginning of it. And you hear just all screaming, you know, kind of, you know, kind of interesting thing. But it was a lot of fun. And uh, Mike, had done, Mike had worked on that with Joe. And that, that game did really well. It was one of the first CD-ROMs to come out besides Virtual Valerie uh, that sold CD-ROMs for people to buy a game. So Cyan didn't know anything about any of these things. I mean, the brothers are fairly, you know, pure back then. And, uh, you know, they would, like, blanch at anything I would say. Do you have a virtual valley? Oh, no, don't talk about that stuff. You know, because their father was a priest, a, a minister at a local church. And uh, nice guy, though. Nice, nice, nice parents. And um, it's not like Donald Trump. Nice parents. Yeah, yeah, nice parents. Believe me. Uh, but anyway, he... he Mike had done this thing, and there was another game that came out around the same time uh, before Miss two games. Um, one was called uh, The Seventh Guest, came out back then, which is very mist like uh, at least in as far as you click around from object, you know, you go from room to room the same way. It wasn't nearly done in the same level of detail that we did it in. I think they used photos for some of the backgrounds in that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then there was another game called uh, um, The Journeyman Project, which was done by Presto Studios. Which you really had to have a fast machine to run that game, because otherwise it would just like it was so slow. But I'll give you I'll give you a little bit of things. There's something I stole directly from Journeyman Project and put it into Mist. And I'll admit it, it was a great idea. They had a little itty bitty window, and they had this minecart ride that you, you you were looking in this room, and you had this little window, and you saw the mine going by. Is anybody familiar with the Selenitic Age and a little? <laughs> I said, hey, we could put a little animation. There's a story there too. I'll tell you that in a minute. You guys have probably heard that one already about how my bet with Rand Miller and no, okay, I won two hundred dollars. Rand actually paid me two hundred bucks for this bet. But anyway, there was uh, that game, and uh, so there really wasn't a whole lot to, you know, people were hungry for this kind of game. So you could have, you know, a hundred times that, and people would still buy it. Mist was still done well, and then after Mist, of course, you had all these different knockoffs. You know, you had Pissed, and um, you know, and Pissed was always a lot of fun, but uh, it was like very short. Thankfully, um, and you had like a lot of the other games that kind of played off of that whole kind of genre thing. You know, and by that time I was already moving on to a game called Carandia and uh, Lands of Lore, at Westwood Studios, and the Command and Conquer series. <clears throat> but the d the technology back then, as well as just the fact that there really weren't a whole lot of games, made it a lot easier to develop something that was kind of considered unique. So what happened then is that, you know, anybody could do something. Now, if Mist were to appear today and having not had the history it had back then, chances are it would be totally ignored. It, there was, there, it still had a great story and everything else, but it wouldn't be the probably phenomenal success it was back then. Because back then people bought Mist. They bought the game because um, 
uh, one, it was something totally new, and the graphics were, you know, really advanced uh, back then. I, I still cringe when I look at those, and I go, oh, God. But uh, the thing is, is that back then it, it was something different. Nowadays it would be buried in a lot of other similar types of games. But the thing that I think made it stand apart still were the story, and I think that's what still makes things stand apart in games today. You can have a hundred different games that are all on the same genre, unless you've got a really good story that you know propels people and you understand something about marketing, which is really important. Um, you can get a small game out there and have it be successful. You know, our little Zed Kickstarter. While well, we raised all the money we wanted, we were successful. Um, we got fifty thousand unique hits. And each, and they divided it down to like I think it's 80 seconds per hit. You know that means people stuck around for 10 minutes, or they stuck around for 20 seconds. But people stay. We got like all these different people, unique individual hits, which means the game is out there. People know about it. And we were interviewed 50 or 60 times, you know, by a variety of different tweet, you know, Twitch streams and a bunch of other things and blogs and what have you. Uh, PC Gamer uh, did a couple stories on us, and. The thing is that, that nowadays the marketing is really important. So you can still, if you've got something that's unique, I still think it can be something that's going to stand out. Dear Esther, this little game made basically by two people, you know, is a wonderful game, and it did really well. It sold, I think it made a profit within five hours after releasing. And then within six months, it already sold over a million copies. And uh, uh, the Stanley Parable is something just along the same line. It did really, really well. It's this little funky game that they, they just grabbed a bunch of assets from some office supply 3D store someplace and made a game out of them. And it was, it was great. They didn't build a single asset for that game. Maybe the tree at the end, I think. But the thing is is that they took a really unique idea, and I think that you know, there is room still in the industry, and there always will be, for you know, really unique things with good, good stories and, and good ideas. And you know, it's like a movie. I mean, how many movies are made a year? You know, but you can either like the really big blockbusters, but I love indie movies, you know, and my favorite movie of all time still, it's basically an indie movie, is called Dark City. And I don't know if he's ever seen Dark City. Go see Dark City. It is an excellent, excellent movie. Um, you know, so it's uh, something that, you know, it stood out amongst a lot of movies, you know, like The Matrix and everything else during the time. I think it's much better than The Matrix. It's a similar world is not what it seems kind of thing. And, uh, so, you know, games, I think, still stand out, especially if it's nonviolent and uh, if it's something that's story-based and you have a really good, compelling story to tell, you can make something successful. And th that's the important thing. And there's a real call for nonviolent games right now because people are, you know, maybe not if you're a Trump supporter, but, you know, otherwise. <laughs> Sorry if I'm offending any Trump supporters. I meant to do that. So, <laughs> Come on. What's that? Oh, the $200 story for Rand. Okay. Rand and Robin uh, came up with the Selenitic Age, uh, which you guys are familiar with. As the little, you go into the little bubble. My, my, I, I talked about it in the Make of Mist. It was, uh, I saw the little mermaid, and there was a little blowfish in there. And, you know, that was all just a bunch of bull crap at the time. I had no clue where I got that idea. I saw a blowfish somewhere. And I figured out, I'll just say this, you know, they were doing that. And they were joking about it. I think I had five different things that I found the, the, blow, the blowfish idea from, and they picked that one. So it's kind of like the Joker in the Batman. Remember, he says, you know, my father, you know. Anyway, uh, so what happened was is they created this, um, this, this level underneath the, underneath the island. And it was this series of walkways. It's, uh, I, they think they may have been, Robin and Ram may have been a little inspired by uh, there was a movie, oh, God, what was the name of it? It's about these dwarves who were trying to, uh, to discover something, and, and I, I can't remember what it was, but there's this area, and there's, like, all these platforms, and they go over these chasm, huh? Time bandits. time bandits, yes, time bandits. I couldn't remember what it was. But it was, it was a gr it's a great little movie, and I haven't seen it since it was in a theater, so it's been a long time. But it was, they had this one scene there where all these platforms are going under each other and over each other, and that's exactly what uh, the Selenitic level was supposed to be like. And each of these, these platforms would walk to another hub. And you'd have, like I think is uh, one, two, three, four different platforms would come out, uh, walkways would come out of each hub, and you had a central stand in the center. And a sound would emanate out of that stand that would say, okay, if it's, you know, a dong, you know, it's this one. If it's, if it's a ding, it goes that one. If it's ding, it's that or something. And so you'd have to pick whichever walkway and figure your way around to finally get yourself to the end of the, end of the level. 
where they drawn it all out on, on uh, a couple sheets of, uh, of graph paper. And it's like this huge collection of stuff. And I'm like going, you know, this is really complex. And they said, yeah, but we want you to do this. And I said, okay. And I said, all right, I'll do this, and I'll have it for you in less than two weeks. And Rand said, no way you're going to get this done in two weeks. And so I said, no, I'll, I'll have it done in two weeks. So, excuse me, I, um, I put the thing together in Strat. I built it out. And I, I had a technique that Robin didn't use exactly. I, I used Adobe Illustrator for a lot of my templates. So what I did as an illustrator, I just made, I made a, a walkway with steps going up. One, uh, a shorter set of steps. A couple different straightaways, one with that had a big arch in the middle, and the walkway would go up and then come down, and you have a big arch in the middle, so you can put another path under it. And then I just extruded out about 10 different objects, and I pieced it all together in about a week and uh, made the level. And, uh, and I handed it off to Rand, and I said, here it is. And I even did a couple test walkthroughs and parts of it to show him here how it works. And he goes, that is really cool, you know, and, 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 I, and we'd made a bet prior to my starting this that I couldn't get it done. And I said, 200 bucks. And so he wrote me a check for $200 because I had it done in 10 days. But the reason it wasn't used is that if anybody's familiar with how long it took to render a single object, a single scene in Mist, has anybody heard stories about how long it took to render images? Well, you know, one single scene in this would take anywhere from 30 to 50 hours to render because of the complexity of it. And this is before there was alpha channels on stuff. So, you know, the software was pretty primitive. Uh, and we were kind of limited to the technology of the time. And then when we started going through and placing cameras around for everything, it would have taken about four or five years to render the entire game, that entire level by itself. And so we're like scratching our heads trying to figure out what to do. And luckily for them, I've been playing other games, and I was playing the Journeyman Project. And I saw this little tiny, you know, window... And I said, why don't we do like a rail thing? I can make six or seven different versions of turning left and turning right and going up and going down and pulling into a, a, a hub, a central hub, and then rotating around the hub to take you someplace else. And they said, hey, that's pretty good. So I started designing it, and I built a little ship for it. And uh, I was inspired by the, the building, the room inside of it. You were talking about inspiration. That was inspired by Alien, that, that walls were on the outside. I said, oh, I'm going to make this look kind of like alienish, you know? And so... Uh, whereas my, my, my sources for inspiration and stealing came from movies and comic books and stuff like that. Robin lived in National Geographic. If you look at his stuff, it's very National Geographic-ish, you know, including a head that he took from National Geographic that uh, they ended up getting sued for because he scanned it out of National Geographic and used it and missed. <laughs> Did they tell you that one? So don't tell them I told you. There's, wait, I'm being streamed right now. <laughs> he didn't do that. I'm lying. So, <laughs> no, they took it. From what I understand, I think they had a cease and desist or something. I don't know what it was. Right, to pay a, a like pay something for it. At least that's what I heard from somebody who worked there after I left. But um, the thing is, is that we each came into this from our own sets of of inspiration, and we we drew from as many sources as we could. Jurassic Park came out while we were working on this. And, I, you know, there's no dinosaurs in mist, but at least as far as I recall. But uh, so, yeah, that, that's, that's the story, and that's how I, I got 200 bucks from Rand Miller. And I have a, on my Twitter page, there's, a, there's an image of that, actually, on Twitter, of the actual level, the picture of it. So you can take a look at it. I'll have to send it. I'll give it to, I'll give it to Elliot. You had mentioned that you drew a lot of inspiration from your dreams. I was wondering if you have any techniques for inducing a creative dream state, or perhaps you use lucid dreaming. Uh, I do lucid dream, and I always lose control of it, which is, I think, more fun because it goes always dark when I do that. Uh, lots of drugs, that helps. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I don't even drink, so. But, uh, yeah, I, it, it depends on really, you know, how much sleep I got. I find that I, I tend to dream extremely vivid. Sometimes, anybody ever have that time in, when you're falling asleep and you, you're not even asleep yet and you're dreaming? And it turns awful, like really fast. You know, it's kind of like, I had heart surgery about 20 years ago, and I remember I, could, I would do that. I couldn't sleep real well, so I was always having these awful dreams. And, and there, uh, there's going to be one or two instances in Zed that are relying on that. There's going to be this, this feeling something's following you in one of the dark areas of the dream. 
and it's going to be behind you. And you can always look around. You don't see anything, but it's going to be there, and you'll hear the breathing and hear the steps. So Zed's going to have Zed's going to have some dark areas in it. You know, it's all nice and bright and cheerful that you've seen, but there's other parts of it that you know we want to give you a, a full experience of a dreamscape. My ski, my dreams. I'm digging up dreams actually from when I was a child. So there's a, I used to dream about a city. I used to sneak out of the. My parents were going through a divorce when I was a young kid, and, and I couldn't sleep. And so I used to sneak out of my, my, my house where I lived at my neighborhood, and I'd wander around the neighborhood at night. And I used to go into town and, and be like 4 o'clock in the morning. There's this little kid walking through. I can't imagine doing that now. But back in the 60s, it was a lot probably somewhat safer, I would guess. But the dreams I had from that still stick with me of the, that city and that getting lost in some place. And so that's, that part is more realistic, but it's still going to have a bit of a distorted feel to it, distortion field, so to speak, so it's going to appear off. But that's, that's another dream that I, my dreams jump from very photoreal to just normal places that are just exaggerated. I mean, like, you know, a factory building that suddenly is gigantic, and there's, like, walkways, and there's water under it and stuff like that, and just odd things. And, you know, a lot of that stuff's going to make it. But as far as inducing it, I, I don't really have control over it. It just sort of happens. Sometimes if I have something that's particularly vivid, I'll, I'll wake up and I write it down. So I keep a dream journal. So that helps a lot. And then somebody who talks about lucid dreaming says that you can actually, before you fall asleep, say, I'm going to remember my dreams. I'm going to remember my dreams. I'm going to lucid dream and as you're falling asleep. And supposedly it kind of keys up your mind in order to be able to you remember that somehow in your dream. I don't know how it works, but I, I, I tried it, and it seems to work. My favorite one's falling, you know, like laying on my belly in the middle of a neighborhood with a bunch of other people. and Yeah. Yeah. My dreams get pretty weird sometimes, so. Sure. Um, how can a freshman illustration or graphic design student break into the field? How can a graphic design student break into the field? Well, you really have to pigeonhole, I mean, pinpoint exactly what it is that you want to do. You know, the best thing to do is to, is to you know, are you, are you, do you want to be a 3D artist? Do you want to be uh, a texture artist? You know, do you want to be a level designer? You know, find that part of gaming that really excites you and then start focusing all your studying on that on that end of it and uh, by the time you 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 finish college hopefully you've got a good idea as far as what the direction is going to be that you want to do and then start looking for jobs you can start there's all kinds of different job resources for gaming online uh, so I would check those out as much as possible because there's a lot of jobs around. I see a lot of them tend to be in Europe nowadays, and the U.K. seems to be looking for a lot of people. Australia, too, and Netherlands. Uh, you know, they, they appreciate gaming a lot more in those countries than they do here, at least the industry does, the industry in those countries. Cause they provide all kinds of um, incentives, financial incentives for game companies, which means they, they hire more people typically. But um, I would say just, you know, find something that you really love doing in the game industry and then just do it and then shoot for that. Just find out what companies are hiring by going online. You can also go to any game company site you want to go to. If it's Electronic Arts or any of their, uh, there are many games that they have under their umbrella or Activision. Find a studio you might want to work with. Check a bunch of different studios and see what they're, what they're, uh, who they're looking for hiring. A lot of times they'll have something that says, we're hiring now, and uh, they'll have uh, a chance to be able to, uh, you know, for you to be able to send your portfolio or your resume or whatever to. But I will advise you one thing. I, you know, being an artist um, in the game industry for as long as I've been doing it, and I, being an art director and, and also a group manager where I managed 70 artists back in Vicarious Visions and uh, then ended up sharing the role with another, another guy, thankfully. Uh, it was, a, you know, it's like managing 70 artists. You know, you know herding cats doesn't even start. Um, but uh, I was in charge of hiring people, too. And I always looked at portfolios that people sent for a job opening we had, and if their portfolio didn't speak out to me within the first 10 seconds of watching it, I would either, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, I'd watch it for just a little bit. If it didn't jump like that and there was something really cool in it that caught my eye, I would throw it in a pile of maybe I'll check this later again. Because that's the one thing when you're designing a portfolio, be it online or be it, you know, as a reel, put the best work you've got up front at the very front of it. And then, you know, don't give me a ton of work, but give me a good idea so that way I can call you back and ask for more. In uh, designing Myths, did you design most of like this world and Robin did this world, or did you both kind of do a little bit throughout 
the whole game. We we divided up the the worlds pretty pretty uh, raunchy at the start. You know, Robin had the the areas that he really wanted to do, and uh, and then I got I got the rest of them as well. And I thought that like the mechanical age sounded like a lot of fun, so I asked to do that one. I think I don't remember the exact particulars about how they were they were parsed out, but I know that we got stuff that we really wanted to try, and uh, we just decided between us that which who was going to do what, and. Uh, for the most part, you know, I think that, you know, we would help each other out on occasion. Like I would do a sketch or something like that if we ran into an issue or Robin would have a suggestion. There was a lot of back and forth. We always would have meetings and take a look at all the art to see who was doing what. And, um, you know, it tended to be very, uh, in a lot of ways, considering that we all lived away from each other, not in the same office space, uh, we were very collaborative in a lot of ways. So, but, yeah, that's way. Um, what was your experience with Kickstarter? Anything you do differently now that you've been through it? Uh, I do exactly the same thing, except for ask more more money. That would be, a, I would think that would be what we'd probably end up doing. Um, Kickstarter is a very funny beast. Has anybody here done a Kickstarter? One. Were, were you successful? There you go. So now, anybody who knows how to do a successful Kickstarter means that you'd give up your life for the month your Kickstarter is up. And maybe a month beforehand, if not more, because it takes. There's a lot of updating you have to do. You have to do a ton of work. Uh, you're always on social media. You're always, you know, posting up images, whatever. You try to keep the page live. You try to keep people's interest in live. There's a lot of nuance to using Twitter and something like that. You find the right times to release tweets. You find the right time to do Facebook. We found Facebook was actually very good for us, surprisingly. Um, would I do anything different? Probably would wait till I was a little further along in the game next time, I think, would be the big difference. So that way we'd have more to kind of release, like, here's a little bit and here's a little bit more. Then I, then I might be able to sleep a little bit more, I think, next time. Because I didn't sleep at all during Kickstarters, constantly working on trying to get the levels done and things like that. It was a lot of work. So I know that Cyan had, uh, for their Kickstarter for abduction, I know Rand was like, you know, they're at that last point. They're like $800,000 and a few days to go. And they still had like, what was it, uh, 1.1 million, 1.100, 200 or 300,000 more to go. And I know it's it's nerve-wracking as hell. And then they, they got that push at the end, that, and they went over, and, and I know how joyous that feeling is. So, uh-oh. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know that your career has been focused on interactive art, but given that how easy Unreal makes it to modify the environment, I was wondering if you have given any thought to doing, <coughs> sorry, um, more like narrative non-interactive things like cartoons basically I guess. Uh, so the VR end of it is kind of pushing that end of it right now. Unreal is being used for a lot of that type of thing where they're giving you, like, they're making cartoons or animated, you know, Pixar-type animations uh, that lets you walk through, not necessarily walk through, but look at the world through a 360 degrees lens, so to speak. Ourselves, personally, no. We, we haven't only because we're, you know, we're pretty focused on games. And, you know, we've got two other games we have planned right after this. So we want to make sure that Zed is successful enough for us to push Curio, which is our next game. And then the last game would be Murdoch's World. So, but um, I know that there are people doing it. And Unreal is, and, and Unity too, from what I saw, Unity has this great thing about this robot or these robots I saw. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but it looks pretty awesome. It's, it's, an, it's not an interactive movie, but it's a virtual movie or short uh, that looks really cool. So I think that that's something that's starting to, you know, people are starting to see as as kind of the future of some of that stuff. What it actually means, you know, I don't know what it means in it for the future. Who knows? VR is so new right now, and uh, it's just still in its infancy. Who knows what's going to look like 10 years down the road? But I know that Unreal and Unity, they're developing their tools to be able to take care, you know, to be able to um, fill in that space when they need to. And they are already, So because those tools are very easy to plop animations into, put environments in, and then just tell a story, you know, a linear story, because you can control where the camera is. You know, that's easy to do. So, yeah, I think that's something that uh, you're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Welcome. 
Hey, this is more of a, a technical thing, but uh, you were showing us your asset browser in Unity, and you said there are thousands of dollars of of assets that you've used in the game, and then, but you also said you'd modeled everything. So, what do those assets? What what's in those assets that you've used in the game that aren't three D models? I'm just curious. Almost well. The stuff that I used in Zed and we'll be using it here are, are as I said before, it's kind of 3D clip art. You know, there's a, a variety of things like chairs and why there's no point in rebuilding something as simple as a chair. It's just a waste of time when I can get an asset for a dollar and uh, or get a whole collection of them for $20 or $30 or whatever. Uh, in the game right now, what you see is the trees and the rocks. That's about the only thing that I've used that I got from the asset store in Zed. All this other stuff I built individually myself. So, you know, as I said before, I, I work very fast, and, and as I'm building things, I see other things that I could build and, and uh, you know, start, you know, knocking everything out in 3D. In the actual game itself, there'll be a lot of 2D assets that, you know, will be in the distance. There's no point in building a 3D model of a, a cityscape if I'm not going to get any closer than, you know, half a mile from it. You know, because if you look at any, if you go into Unreal and you look at a lot of the demo games that they have available or into Unity, uh, you'll see that the, the game's, Control where you are. We're always, unless it's a procedural world, but you're always controlled where you're allowed to play at, and you can always set things up like, you know, the old movie days when they made movies. They just had the storefront, you know, with a couple supports holding up the front of the building, you know, because you never saw inside of it, you know. So games are the same thing, you know, as long as you, you know, give them, you know, enough space to see it and don't let them get too close to it. Though I will admit, though, in, in Zed, we're going to be putting a lot of little Easter eggs all over the place in there, so things to find. We even have some, like, you know, uh, Easter egg hunts that people can get, and we'll give prizes for that when we actually release it. So does that answer your question? Oh, okay. Cool. Okay, well, we're out of time, but thank you very much for... You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And, and we'll I got a bunch of Zed stickers up here if anybody wants one. And we'll have Cyan's presentation coming up in a half hour at 4 o'clock.